Hello everyone, this is Yashwin from Exam Help Bulb. In this video, I'll be solving paper 2, variant 3, May June 2022, AS level chemistry. Question 1a define first ionization energy. So, ionization energy is an energy required to remove an electron from each atom in one mole of gaseous atoms. And when the first electron is removed, that would be first ionization energy. B. Successive ionization energies for element A are shown in table 1.1. Use the table to deduce the group of periodic table that A belongs to and explain your answer. To deduce the group that A belongs to, you would look at the differences between consecutive ionization energies. So the difference between first, second, second, third, and so on the largest difference that you would observe in ionization energies occurs between sixth and seventh ionization energy so going from 13000 to 71000 all of the other differences are similar or following a pattern this is the first large difference that you would observe which indicates that a belongs to group six and that's because A would have six electrons in its outermost or valence shell. So any group six elements like A would have six electrons in their outermost shell. When all of the six electrons in the valence shell are removed, and the seventh electron is removed from a shell that's not the valence shell. So this new shell is going to be closer to the nucleus. So a greater amount of energy is required to overcome attraction between nucleus and electron to remove the seventh electron in a group six element. Part C, across period three, there is a general trend for first ionization energies to increase due to increase in attraction between nucleus and the outer electron. Explain why the first ionization energy of sulfur is less than that of the first ionization energy of phosphorus. So according to this trend in period three, sulfur should have a larger ionization energy compared to phosphorus, but it doesn't because uh, all of the p orbitals of sulfur are filled. Let me draw the, write down the electronic configuration of sulfur and phosphorus to explain this better. So sulfur has 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2 and 3p6 electrons whereas phosphorus has 1s2, 2p, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2 and 3p5 electrons. So there are 3p orbitals in both sulfur and phosphorus. As you can see in sulfur all of those orbitals are occupied with each orbital having the maximum that it can carry two electrons in phosphorus however you've got five electrons so uh, when you remove the first electron from sulfur you wouldn't require as much energy as you would in phosphorus because due to the attraction between the two electrons in the same orbital this is called spin pair repulsion which decreases the ionization energy and this is the reason sulfur doesn't follow the trend in period three so here you need to mention that the spin pair repulsion in sulfur would outweigh the increase in nuclear charge, meaning that even though going from phosphorus to sulfur, there is an increase in nuclear charge. So you'd assume that greater energy would be required to remove electron. The repulsion between 3p orbitals again would outweigh this increase in nuclear charge. D, in an aluminum ion, the nuclear attraction for the outer electrons is stronger than in an atom of sodium. Compare the electronic structure of aluminum with a charge of two plus and an atom of sodium and explain why the third ionization energy of aluminum is gr greater than the first ionization energy of a sodium. So aluminum's atomic number is 13, meaning it's got the electronic configuration as this. 
Now, when aluminum forms an ion with a charge of plus two, two of the outermost electrons are removed, which would give it an electronic configuration of 3s1 being the last electron. Sodium has the same electronic configuration with 11 electrons. So the outermost electron is in 3s1 orbital. This is the similarity between sodium and aluminium ion. Now aluminium with a charge of plus 2 has greater nuclear charge compared to the neutral sodium which only has 11 protons compared to aluminium which would have 13 protons. So this means the attraction for 3s1 electron in aluminium is greater compared to sodium. So the ionization energy of aluminium with a charge of 2 plus is greater than ionization energy in sodium. Part E, an isotope of copper has a relative isotopic mass of 65, complete table 1.2 for an atom of copper 65. So this is the isotopic mass. The atomic mass of copper is 29, meaning that that's the number of protons and electrons in a neutral atom. The nucleon number is the same as the mass number and number of neutrons is the mass number minus the atomic number which for copper is equal to 36 and the electronic arrangement again would be the electronic configuration using the fact that it's got 29 electrons that's 10 electrons Here you notice that 3d orbitals are filled first and 4s is filled afterwards. A similar pattern is observed in chromium where you have 4s1 and 3d5. Instead of having 4s2 being filled first. F1, the element copper has relative atomic mass of 63.5. Calculate how many atoms are present in 1.05 grams of copper. To find the number of atoms, you first need to know the number of moles. So the number of moles in 1.05 grams is equal to the mass divided by the atomic mass, which is equal to 0.0165 mole. And now you can use the fact that 1 mole is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23 atoms which means you can find the number of atoms in the copper as well by using cross multiplication. So x multiplied by 1 is equal to 0.165 multiplied by the Avogadro's constant and that's equal to 9.96 times 10 to the power of 21 atoms. Part 2, copper has a melting point of 1085 degrees Celsius and a high electrical conductivity. Explain these properties of copper by referring to its structure and bonding. The high melting point of copper is due to the strong metallic bonds that hold the structure and it conducts electric electricity because of the delocalized electrons that are free to move throughout the structure. So again, here you need to know the metallic structure where electrons from the outer shell will move out of the atom and they will surround the ions that are formed after electrons have left and these electrons are free to move around the structure carrying a charge which results in electric current. Question 2. A period 3 elements and their compounds show trends in their physical properties. 1. On figure 2.1, sketch a graph to show the melting points of the first 5 elements in period 3. 
So the first three elements here are metals and meta their melting points would increase going from sodium to magnesium to aluminum. And then in period three, the highest melting point is of the element silicon. Let's say it's over there. And then phosphorus has the lowest of all melting points. It's a non-metal, so it would have a lower melting point than sodium. Part two, complete table 2.1 and with information for sodium chloride and phosphorus pentachloride. Stating their state at room temperature. All right, sodium chloride is an ionic compound, so it's a solid at room temperature. That's because it has a very high melting point due to the strong electrostatic forces of attraction which hold the ionic structure. And phosphorus pentachloride is also a solid. The name of change which occurs in, at, on addition of water, sodium chloride being an ionic compound would only get dissolved in water, whereas phosphorus pentachloride being a covalent compound would get hydrolyzed. pH of final solution of sodium chloride in water is 7, so it's a neutral compound, whereas phosphorus pentachloride would have a low pH, so for example 2, that's because it gets dissolved in water to form phosphoric acid as well as hydrochloric acid. Part B, tenazine is an unstable man-made element which is found below astatine in group 17. The chemical properties of tenazine and its compound have only been predicted. Part 1, suggest an equation for the reaction of sodium tenazine and bromine. Assume that tenazine follows the same trends as the other elements in group 17. Explain your answer. So you're supposed to predict the reaction between sodium tenazine and bromine. This would be a displacement reaction if the halogen with sodium is less reactive than the other one. If, uh, as the question mentions, tenazine is below S astatine, this means it's going to be a weaker oxidizing agent than bromine. So bromine will oxidize tenazine, meaning that tenazine will be displaced. So here tenazine has an oxidation state of negative one. And when bromine oxidizes tenazine, it would form sodium bromide plus tenazine. Now you just need to balance the equation. So you've got two bromine atoms over here and tenazine would also exist in the same form that other halogens do. It's important here to mention that bromine will oxidize the ions that have a negative charge. Part 2. Some scientists predict that tenazine has properties typical of metals like copper. Complete Table 2.2 with the predicted melting point and the lattice structure of solid chlorine, bromine, and tenazine. Assume that tenazine has properties typical of metals like copper. The lattice structure of crystalline, crystalline solid of chlorine is simple molecular since chlorine is a non-metallic element and same case for bromine. Now the question here mentions that tenazine has the same properties of metals like copper so we would go to assume that it has a giant metallic structure like copper and due to this it would have a high melting point so for example, 300 degrees Celsius. Question three, G belongs to a group of compounds called ethers. When G is heated, thermal decomposition occurs. The atoms in a molecule of carbon monoxide are held by a triple covalent bond. One of these bonds is a coordinate 
or dative covalent bond. So in a dative covalent bond, both of the electrons for the bond are donated by one of the atoms that are involved in the bond. Draw a dot and cross diagram to show the arrangement of outer electrons in a carbon monoxide molecule. Use a dot for oxygen electrons and a cross for carbon electrons. Now between carbon and oxygen, carbon has four electrons in its outermost shell. It needs four more electrons to complete its octet, whereas oxygen has six electrons. So it needs fewer electrons or only two electrons to complete the octet, which means oxygen will be the donating uh, element in this dative bond. The first two bonds would be normal covalent bonds. The third would be a dative bond. So this is the first normal pair, the second one, and then oxygen will donate a pair of electrons. And then oxygen would have only a single pair of non-bonding electrons. Carbon would also have one of those pairs. And as you can see, both of the atoms now have eight electrons. Part two, calculate the bond energy of carbon monoxide using the bond energy values in table 3.1 and the enthalpy change for the thermal decomposition of G. Show your working. So you know the thermal enthalpy change for the entire reaction. To explain here, I'd like to draw the structure of the uh, reactants and the product compounds. This is the reactant ether, which breaks down to form three different products, one of which is the carbon monoxide. So enthalpy change of reaction would be the sum of energy changes that are taking place in the reaction. Bond breaking is endothermic. Bonds of the reactants are broken and then new bonds will form in the product. So the bond energies of uh, the reactant would be taken as positive, whereas bond energies of the product would be taken as negative, as bond forming in the products is exothermic. All right, now here uh, we have got one and two carbon-carbon bonds, which means you would sum up two multiplied by 350 with the bond energy of carbon-hydrogen uh, carbon and hydrogen. So here you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 of carbon hydrogen bonds. And lastly, you've got two bonds of carbon and oxygen. So that would be 2 multiplied by 360. This is the enthalpy of breaking the bonds. And then forming the bonds, which is exothermic, you would subtract their energies, and that would be again here you have one let me use another color one two three four five six seven eight nine and ten carbon hydrogen bonds and then you've got only a single carbon carbon double bond so 10 multiplied by 410 plus 350 and the last enthalpy would be the enthalpy for the carbon monoxide bond which is unknown. And this is equal to the enthalpy change of reaction, which is given in the question as negative seven. So 5,520 minus 4,450 minus the carbon monoxide bond enthalpy is equal to negative seven, which results in the bond enthalpy for carbon monoxide as positive 1,077 kilojoule per mole. Part three, when G is heated in a sealed container, an equilibrium mixture is produced. Complete the expression for the equilibrium constant for this reaction. State the units for Kc. The equilibrium constant would have a fraction with the concentrations of the products in the numerator. That would be C2H6, carbon monoxide, and methane. In the numerator, the denominator would have the concentration of the product. Now here you've got, these are all concentrations. So let's say you've got mole per dm cube to the power of 3. 
divided by mole per dm cube and that leaves us with mole per dm cube squared which is equal to mole squared per dm6 and those are your units part 4 thermal decomposition of gene the presence of iodine affects activation energy for the reaction table 3.2 shows the activation energy for thermal decomposition of g with and without iodine so with iodine you've got 143 kilojoule per mole and with uh, without iodine energy is higher so obviously iodine here is acting as a catalyst state what effect adding iodine to the reaction mixture has on the value of kc and explain your answer now adding iodine would not affect the equilibrium mixture which is why it will also not affect the equilibrium constant equilibrium constant can only be changed by changing temperature for a reaction that's exothermic or endothermic so clearly iodine will not change kc as you can see kc is dependent on the concentration of reactants and products at equilibrium these concentrations can only be changed by changing temperature and nothing else would change it and as the concentration of reactant and product products do not change at equilibrium the kc value would also not change here you would say that it doesn't affect the position of equilibrium and that's because if the position of the equilibrium were to change let's say if it shifted to the right hand side the concentration of products would increase if it shifted to the left hand side the concentration of reactants would increase which would eventually change this ratio part 5 figure 3.2 shows the boltzmann distribution of energies for molecules of g at constant temperature t sketch on figure 3.2 the boltzmann distribution of energies for molecules of g at higher temperature for example t plus 100 degrees celsius at a higher temperature more of the molecules would have a higher energy so increasing the temperature would increase kinetic energy you need to know that kinetic energy of molecules is proportional to the temperature and this means the peak of the graph would shift to right hand side so here you can see the peak of the graph which essentially corresponds to a higher number of molecules having this ionization energy as number of molecules is represented by the area under the graph and this peak would be lower in height because you want to keep the area under the graph same part b the functional group in g is an oxygen atom bonded to two carbon atoms g h and j are structural isomers with molecular formula c for h 10 o h and j are straight chain molecules table 3.3 shows the boiling points and the reactions of g h and j when heated under reflux with s excess acidified potassium dichromate you can see that g remains orange so it sh shows no change whereas h and j would show color change from orange to green this is a sign that potassium dichromate has oxidized h and j part one identify the type of structural isomerism shown between j and h using the information in table 3.3 heat and the reflux with uh, acidif acidified potassium dichromate is the condition required to oxidize alcohols this indicates that h and j could be alcohols now g is an ether and h over here is an alcohol so it's functional group isomerism between these two compounds since they have the same molecular formula part 2 asks you to identify the type of structural isomerism shown between h and j using the information in table 3.3 so here you can see that H has a higher, much higher boiling point compared to J, 
let's look at this let's look at their structures h and g are both alcohols with a straight chain as mentioned in the question so their isomerism would be due to the position of hydroxyl group on the carbon chain these are positional isomers determining that kind of isomerisms you would mainly have structure so you would mostly see structural isomerism or stereoisomerism in structural isomerism you would have uh, isomers due to branch or position and stereoisomerism occurs when you either have carbon carbon double bond or an optical center since we're not giving information related to this type of isomerism and we know that the structures j and h are not branched it has to be position isomerism part three draw a possible structure for h and for j state the systematic name for each structure now again h and j are both straight chain alcohols with the only difference being the position of the position of hydroxyl group so you've got four carbon atoms in both of the structures in one of them the hydroxyl group would be in the first carbon atom the second structure would have hydroxyl group on the second carbon atom one of the so this one's butane one all and this one's butane two all as those are the only two possible straight chain isomers of alcohol with the molecular formula C4H10O. Between these two structures, the chain alcohol allows tighter packaging of molecules. And let me represent this using a diagram of the structure. So these are molecules of butane one, all that are packed together. On the other hand, here you've got butane 2 all now in butane 1 all since the molecules are more closely packed together the van der Waals forces between butane 1 all are stronger as the molecules have a larger surface area for contact with each other which will give it a higher boiling point so we know that h has the higher boiling point meaning that h is butane 1 all and as you can see, these molecules over here have a much looser packing, which means their boiling point due to Van der Waals forces would be weaker, as the Van der Waals forces here are weaker. K has molecular formula C3H6O. When K is added to 2,4-DNPH, an orange precipitate forms. Aldehydes and ketones form an orange precipitate with 2,4-DNPH, so we know that K has to be either one of them. When K is warmed with Tollens reagent, a silver mirror forms. So only aldehydes form a silver mirror with Tollens reagent, which means that K is an aldehyde. So it would have CH2, CH3, and then CHO, a structure like this. The displayed formula here so carbon that's bonded to the the carbonyl carbon would have bond angle of 120 degrees whereas the other carbon atoms have tetrahedral geometry with a bond angle of 109.5 question 4a 2 methyl propene reacts with hydrogen chloride at room temperature the major product is 2 chloro 2 methyl propane complete for figure 4.1 to sh show the structure of the intermediate and the mechanism for the reaction include charges dipoles lone pairs of electrons and curly arrows as appropriate so this is electrophilic addition reaction 
its um, addition reaction since double bond breaks to form all single bonds and the negative den electron density of the double bond would attract an electrophile. All right. So first off, you have a dipole in the hydrogen chlorine bond. That's because chlorine is more negative than electron, which means it's going to attract this bonding pair of electrons more strongly towards itself, giving it a partial negative charge and a partial positive charge to hydrogen. And electron density of the carbon-carbon double bond will attack the positive, partial positive charge of hydrogen. And then the hydrogen chlorine bond would would break heterolytically. This is heterolytic bond fission, which means both of the electrons of the bond would go to chlorine. So hydrogen, which initially had one electron, now has no electron. It would form a positive charge and chlorine would gain an electron, an extra one, and form a negative charge. When hydrogen bonds to the um, when it bonds to methylpropene, this hydrogen due to its positive charge will, will result in a positive charge in the carbocation which forms by the hydrogen bonding to it. So, here you've got the carbocation which forms with a positive charge because of the fact that the hydrogen which bonded to it was electron deficient. Now, these are the two carbon atoms involved in the double bond. One of them will bond to the hydrogen atom, the other one will bond to chlorine atom. Chlorine atom would bond to the carbon atom that is bonded to the least number of hydrogen atoms. So this carbon atom which is bonded to two methyl groups will bond to chlorine atom and this carbon atom which is bonded to two hydrogen atoms would bond to hydrogen atom and form CH3. So this is the carbon atom over here and this is the carbon atom over here. All right, now the chlorine with an extra pair of electrons would attack the positive central carbon atom and form 2-chloro-2 methylpropane. Remember, the arrowhead would point towards the positive species in both of the cases. Part 2 explain why in this reaction 2-chloro-2 methylpropane is produced at a higher yield than 1-chloro-2 methylpropane. If chlorine atom had bonded to this carbon atom over here, then you would have this structure, which is 1-chloro-2 methylpropane. And this does not form in uh, as much of a quantity as 2-chloro-2 methylpropane because if you were to have this, then the carbocation for this compound would be a primary carbocation where the carbon that has the positive charge is bonded to only one alkyl group. As you can see, for 2-chloro-2-methylpropane, the carbocation is tertiary, meaning that it has three alkyl groups bonded to the positive carbon atom. And this carbocation is more stable than the carbocation over here because the uh, methyl groups over here will donate electrons to the positive carbon atom. And this would reduce the positive charge on carbon atom, making it more stable. And because of this, you would have more of 2-chloro-2-methylpropane forming from the tertiary carbocation which is more stable than the primary carbocation which would form minor product 1-chloro-2-methylpropane. Uh, this second carbocation, even though you have um, three carbon atoms bonded to the positive carbon atoms, the the fact that it's bonded to two hydrogen atoms means that the positive inductive effect makes uh, is not as large so this ion is not as stable as a tertiary carbocation and major product always forms using the most stable carbocation b two bottles labeled q and m each contain a straight chain a halogeno alkane with molecular formula C4H9X 
where X represents chlorine, bromine, or iodine. All right, so we have straight chain halogenoalkanes with the same molecular formula. A sample from each bottle is added to separate samples of equal amounts of aqueous silver nitrate and ethanol. So silver nitrate is used to distinguish between halogens. Silver nitrate with chlorine will chlorine, bromine, and iodine forms white, cream, and yellow precipitates respectively. In each reaction, the same organic product T and a precipitate are made as shown in figure 4.2. Okay, so with um, silver nitrate, not only would you have precipitate of uh, silver halide, for example, silver chloride, silver bromide, or silver iodide, you would also result in um, an alcohol. So initially, let's say if you had C4H9Cl, you would have C4H9OHSD product. The chlorine would be uh, replaced by hydroxyl group. In a nucleophilic substitution reaction and this hydroxyl group comes from the aqueous part of silver nitrate. Table 4.1 describes the color of each of the precipitates made from Q and M. Identify the functional group present in T and name the type of reaction that occurs using the information in figure 4.2 and table 2.1. So Q uh, forms a white pre precipitate meaning Q had chloride ion so it, uh, X in Q was chlorine and M forms a yellow precipitate meaning it had iodine. Okay, so T is the product which forms when chlorine uh, or the halogen is displaced from Q or M. That means T is an alcohol and the type of reaction is nucleophilic substitution. Part 2. Construct an ionic equation to describe the formation of the yellow precipitate produced when M reacts with silver nitrate. Okay, M reacts to form the yellow preci precipitate of silver iodide. In, a in an ionic equation, you only write the ions that are actually reacting to form the precipitate, which means silver and iodide ions react to form the yellow precipitate of silver iodide which is solid in state you don't need to mention the state symbols here part three describe which reagent q or m will produce a precipitate more quickly when each is added to silver nitrate and ethanol explain your answer so q or m when q or m react with silver nitrate let's say q reacts with silver nitrate what happens is the carbon chlorine bond would break so that chlorine would react with silver. Similarly, when M reacts with silver nitrate, the carbon bromine bond would break so that you would be you'd have silver being able to react with bromine and form the precipitate. All right. Now, the rate of reaction of a halide depends on the strength of its bond. If the chlorine, carbon chlorine bond is strong that means it cannot be as easily broken compared to a carbon bromine bond we know that going down group 7 the bond strength of halogens with other atoms like carbon over here would decrease making them uh, less reactive which means q which had chlorine would produce a precipitate slower yeah so Q which has chlorine means that the bond breaking part over here would be slower and so a precipitate which forms from Q would be formed slower compared to carbon uh, bromine bond which is weaker it would be more easily broken and so a bromine would react with silver faster and form a precipitate faster. Part 4 pure T which is the alcohol from the pre previous part is added to alkaline aqueous iodine and a yellow precipitate forms. So this yellow precipitate from iodoform reaction would be CHI3 and an anion also forms. Okay, let's look at the reaction. You have C4H9OH. Remember T was the alcohol, all right? So you have C4H9OH 
reacting with iodine. Now, if um, the iodoform reaction with a particular uh, alcohol gives a positive reaction, the precipitate CHI3, that means it has a structure with where hydroxyl group is bonded to a carbon that's bonded to at least one methyl group. All right, now we have two more um, carbon atoms to complete the structure of T. Let's say this was the structure of T. When I2 reacts with this, this carbon atom over here would form CHI3 and then the remaining part would form anion or you would have CH3 this would remain as it is CH2 and then this carbon atom which is bonded to the hydroxyl group would form CO2 minus and this negative charge is due to the fact that uh, iodine over here is alkaline so this is ion L or also known as propanoate ion. Part 5 deduce the structure of the straight chain halogenoalkane M. M was the compound which formed yellow precipitate, so M had iodine. It had the formula, it would have the formula C4H9I. So M is the halogenoalkane which forms the alcohol T. Here you can see that M also forms T. So when M forms T, the iodine is replaced by hydroxyl group. And as you can see over here, the hydroxyl group is on the second carbon atom, which means uh, the iodine in M was also bonded to the second carbon atom in M. And then of course the rest of the structure is the same. Structure is CH3, CHI, CH2 and CH3. This part over here is the only answer. Question 5a. Butene reacts with potassium manganese to form organic product Y. Alright. So an alkene reacts with potassium manganese to form a product. Alkenes react with potassium manganese to undergo either mild or strong oxidation. So you can have either mild or strong oxidation. This depends on the reaction conditions that are used. If you have um, cold dilute alkaline potassium manganate, that would mean a mild oxidation reaction occurs. If you had a hot concentrated acidified potassium manganate, you would have a strong oxidation. Whenever you have mild oxidation, the butene or the alkene forms a diol. This is the product. When you have strong oxidation, the alkene would term, turn into a carbonyl compound like an aldehyde ketone or carboxylic acid. Now, so why is the product uh, of oxidation? It does not react with sodium carbonate, which means that it cannot be the carboxylic acid from strong oxidation meaning that uh, butene has undergone mild oxidation to form a diol. A gas is produced when excess of N is added to Y. Okay, let me start again. B you have butene with uh, the double bond on second carbon atom. You react it with alkaline, cold dilute alkaline potassium manganate to form a diol, CH3. CHOH again CHOH CH3 now this is why it does not react with sodium carbonate obviously because this is a base and alcohols do not react with base however a gas is produced when an excess of sodium is added to Y when sodium reacts sodium can react with alcohols and uh, when sodium reacts with this compound it would form an alkoxide so O minus an A plus it would replace the hydrogen and both of these hydrogen atoms would form one hydrogen molecule. This is the gas that's produced. And so you now you know which reaction is occurring over here. 
Part 1. Describe the conditions for potassium manganate used in the reaction to form Y from butene. So as I mentioned earlier, you would have mild oxidation and this would use cold dilute conditions. Part 2. 24 cm cube of gas is produced when an excess of sodium is added to 0.01001 mole of Y. Okay, so you have 0.001 mole of the alcohol uh, measured under uh, room conditions. Now 24 cm cube, let's turn this into number of moles. Number of moles for gas is equal to the volume divided by molecular volume. So 24 divided by 24,000 cm cube and this is equal to 0 0.01 mole. Now just note here that the number of moles of Y used and the number of moles of gas produced are equal. Assume that one mole of gas occupies 24 dm cube under room conditions. Deduce a possible structure for Y. Explain your answer. You already know that Y was a was an was a diol. Um, you can also deduce that using the calculation part over here. So um, if you knew that Y is an alcohol, you need to know that alcohols react with sodium metals and for each one hydrogen atom from one hydroxyl group you would have half a mole of hydrogen gas forming so meaning that one mole of com uh, hydroxyl group forms half a mole of hydrogen gas um, if you have the same number of hydrogen gas forming as the number of moles of compound that means in the compound you have two hydroxyl groups each one would form half a mole of hydrogen and so it would result in one mole of hydrogen which is how you would have equal number of moles of the uh, alcohol and hydrogen gas and you would use this calculation to answer the question. Part B Z contains three types of atoms, carbon, hydrogen, and a halogen. The mass spectrum of Z is recorded in figure 5.1, which shows a section of the mass spectrum at mass over charge greater than 63. The fragment at mass over charge 64 is the molecular ion peak. Alright, here we have a mass spectrum question. Mass spectrometry is an analytical technique that can be used to deduce the number of carbon atoms, the structure of a molecule and the presence of chlorine or bromine in a compound without needing them to react. So for example if you wanted to know if a compound has chlorine or bromine you would react them with the silver nitrate and depending on the color of precipitate you would then know if the compound has chlorine or bromine. However you uh, in mass spectrometry you do not need them to react. You would just analyze the molecule. So in this technique, the molecule breaks into fragments as well as being a complete molecule itself. And all of these molecules are given a positive charge. The charged particles are then deflected in magnetic field and then peaks will be formed depending on the mass and the abundance of each fragment. So for example, if you had CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. First off, all, uh, the molecule would be given a positive charge and then this would form a peak. This molecule could be broken down. Let's say this carbon atom is broken down. So it would form CH3, CH2, CH2 plus as well as CH3 plus. This molecule could also have been broken down the middle. So it would form CH3, CH2 plus and the other half of the molecule as well. And of course, all of these fragments or parts of molecules would have different masses. And all of these would have uh, peaks or which are these vertical lines over here. The height of the peak depends on the abundance of each fragment. If you saw the mass over charge values at lower than 63, let's say from uh, 0 or 10, you would also have other peaks because this compound with a mass of 64 is broken, also broken down into smaller fragments. The molecular ion peak means that this peak in, uh, occurs for the mass of the complete molecule. So this, will, this peak will give you the mass of the complete molecule 
it's not broken down into fragments. This is how you will know the molecular mass of the compound that you are dealing with. 65 and 66 over here are the M plus 1 and M plus 2 peaks. These occur due to isotopes. And uh, in our syllabus, we deal with isotopes of chlorine and bromine. You know how chlorine has two isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. So when you add 2 to 35, it forms 37, which is why the if you have chlorine, the M peak is due to chlorine 35 isotope and chlorine 30, uh, the M plus 2 peak is due to chlorine 37 isotopes. Similarly, if you have bromine, the M peak is due to Br79 and M plus 2 peak is due to Br81. And you have different peaks because in a sample of uh, chlorine or bromine, you would have different isotopes of the same element. Now, first part asks you to reduce the number of carbon atoms present in a molecule of Z. Using figure 5.1, you are supposed to show a working. To find the number of carbon atoms, you would use the fact that the ratio of M to M plus 1 peak is equal to 100 is to 1.1 N where n is the number of carbon atoms. Uh, m plus m peak ratio over here, or the abundance of m plus m peak is 100 and 2.2. So 100 divided by 2.2 is equal to 100 divided by 1.1 n. So 1.1 n is equal to 2.2 which means n is equal to 2. So uh, this compound Z has two carbon atoms. Part 2. Reduce which halogen is present in Z using figure 5.1. Explain your answer. You can find this using the ratio of M to M plus 2 peak. As I mentioned earlier in our syllabus, we deal with chlorine and bromine isotopes. And you need to know that the ratio of M, M to M plus 2 peak for chlorine is 3 is to 1 and for bromine it's 1 is to 1. Meaning that the chances of chlorine 35 occurring is, are 3 times more than the chances of chlorine 37. Whereas for bromine, the chances of bromine 79 and bromine 81 occurring in a compound are almost equal. So again, the ratio of M to M plus 2 peak for this compound is 100 is to 33.3, which is almost 3 is to 1, which means that the halogen over here is chlorine. Part 3, there are also peaks at mass over charge 29 and 49, suggest the formula of these fragments, reduce the name of Z. So as I mentioned earlier, this uh, in mass spectrometry, you would, uh, the compound or the molecule would also, also be broken down into smaller fragments. We know that it has two carbon atoms and a chlorine atom, and we can use this to reduce the structure of Z by subtracting the mass of chlorine and two carbon atoms from the molecular mass, which is let's say 64 minus 35 for chlorine and then two multiplied by 12 for carbon atoms. This leaves you with five. And this is a one for each of the five hydrogen atoms that you would have in this structure. Now, uh, this compound can be broken into different fragments for example ch3 plus ch3 ch2 plus or ch2 cl plus the mass of ch3 plus is 15 this one is 29 and this one's 49 so you can just write those down over here and compound z is chloroethane And this is it. We are done with this paper. Thank you for watching.